Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Wow. Good morning. That's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of flutes. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Invested Musician. Uh, this morning we have uh, a fantastic class with Dennis Buryakov, uh, who I will introduce in a minute. Uh, please, if this is your first time to Invested Musician, please let us know uh, where you're coming from. My name is Andrew Bain. I'm the principal horn of the Los Angeles Philharmonic uh, and the co-founder of Invested Musician with Rupal Bain. Uh, so welcome. This is day two of, uh, of our three-day intensive. Uh, yesterday we talked uh, with Robert Domain about auditions and successes and failures and successes uh, in auditions and, uh, and also practice planning. And then this morning, uh, Dennis is going to give us an amazing uh, insight into his ideas about uh, flute fundamentals and techniques on the flute. Um, if, anyone, if anyone hasn't had a chance to hear the LA Phil uh, Carnival of the Animals with Dennis. Do yourself a favour. Uh, check out Soundstage with the LA Phil. It is one of the most spectacular recordings uh, of of anything that I've ever heard with Dennis playing uh, playing flute on that. It's really really quite amazing. So um, yeah, do yourself a favour and, and check that out if you haven't already. Uh, so this morning we have flute fundamentals, and then Rupal is going to be doing something that um, I would recommend all of us uh, taking the time to check out <laughs> is organizing your inbox. It sounds like something that's pretty easy, but uh, most of us have uh, about 10,000 emails floating around in our inbox. And Rupal, I, I had 70,000 at one point, and Rupal got hold of those, and I ended up, I now have um, only about 50, um, and everything is organized, and I know where it's going. So this is going to be a really helpful session uh, after our flute fundamentals. Uh, but without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the principal flute of uh, the Los Angeles Philharmonic and a uh, faculty member here at Investor Musician and the professor of flute at UCLA, Mr. Dennis Buryakov. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Nice Hi. to see all of you coming from all over the place. I see Turkey, London, Hong Kong, Switzerland. It's uh, incredible. One of the advantages of doing this over Zoom, isn't it? So, um, wow, it's a little more people than I expected. I don't have a particular plan for this class, as I was telling Andrew just a few minutes ago. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk in general. By the way, let me turn off echo cancellation. It sounds probably better without it. How is this? Same? Okay, so um, I just wanted to talk in general about sound mostly um, and um, how we produce the sound and why everybody sounds so different on the flute. So, you know, um, I was thinking the other day, you know, you have these mechanical pianos, right, where they replicate, you, you play something and then it repeats the movement you did. I mean, it still sounds pretty different we know, without the person being there, but it can mechanically copy what you do. And I was thinking, if you wanted to do the same thing for the flute, what would the machine look like? Because uh, you would think just a stream of air would do it, but I don't think so. And that's what I want to talk about, because um, the difference between playing a wind instrument or brass and playing, for example, piano is that there's a lot more going on on the inside of the body, I think. And we are actually physically become, becoming one. We are part of the instrument. We're part of the sound. That's why every single flute player sounds so unique. You can recognize the person no matter what flute they pick up. And, you know, I especially like giving examples with somebody who we can all recognize, uh, like James Galway. Uh, when he picks up a uh, student flute 200 series Yamaha, he I remember hearing him and he sounds just like him. It sounds exactly the same to my ears. You know, I mean, of course, if he starts playing something more advanced, you will hear the scale is different. Uh, maybe it's a little uh, not as rich as his Nagahara platinum or whatever, but you know what I mean? Still, you, you recognize the person. And I felt exactly the same with Wib, William Bennett, um, trying instruments. You can always 
recognize the person. So why is that? Why, why doesn't it sound like that flute? Because, I mean, of course, to a certain degree, it's the same with piano, right? Uh, everybody has their own sound, but uh, the instrument matters a lot more. You can't make an upright piano sound like a Steinway full concert grand. So uh, you can get close enough on that instrument, but um, not quite as big difference. And <clears throat> I think um, once you realize that actually what's happening here is as important as what's happening here, the, the embouchure, that can help you to um, change your, or not change, maybe help your voice evolve a little bit. Because a lot of flute players somehow think of the embouchure only and pay much less attention to what's going on deeper inside the body. And I think um, that's extremely important too. So, um, if you, you know how they say you hang the flute outside your car window and it will play. That's what horn players believe, at least. I, I've heard that once or twice <laughs> from Andrew, I think. Um, I think it will make some sound, right? So something. It's true. If you <laughs> do that, it will already produce some sound. But it's not until you put it here and connect this. So we um, we will have something else. And you know, we're in the beginning of the year. Always he would have um, the first session with all the students. We was William Bennett. Sorry for those of you who doesn't know his nickname. Uh, he would have always the first session of the year with, with the students and trying to produce sound on various things. Of course, we can all do this, right? Make sound on the bottle. Um, then you can try other parts of the flute, like that. And then uh, just to realize how the sound is produced, right? Uh, then even this. Anybody can make sound on the cup. <laughs> so if you cover enough of it, you put your chin in there. This is not going to work, Andrew. <laughs> so um, it needs to be, the important thing is how much you cover and what angle you get. And so you can get a different pitch depending on how much you cover. It's similar with the flute. It's just a lot smaller, right? So how much we cover and what angle the air is going is extremely important. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> um, so, getting this the air direction different or gives us completely different sound. Now, how do we know which one is the right one and what is a good sound? And that's always a debate because um, we all have our own idea. Uh, we all have that ideal sound in mind, which we're always chasing, which is hard to actually produce, but we all know what we don't like in our playing. You know, I, I know that in general, I want always to make sure the open, uh, the high register is open, you know, and things like that, that I don't go flat. We always have these ideas in our mind. Um, and sometimes chasing them is, is difficult, but what actually, from physical point makes a good tone and what is in common between all the great players. Um, the other day we did a listening class with, with the students and heard recordings from Nicolet, Rampal, uh, you know, all the recordings of Moise and all that. And I think you can almost certainly find the same thing in common between all of these completely different players coming from different schools. But those who are truly great, have a really unique, beautiful tone, the thing they have in common is that their harmonics are in tune most of the time. And this concept uh, is something Wib talks a lot about, and I think it's a, a very, very important concept for the tone. So what does it mean? Um, when we play or sing or even speak, there's always a pitch, the main pitch, and harmonics right that's how uh, vibration works so the harmonics are doubles of the frequency so if you have 440 the next harmonic is 
880 if you play a440 right the next harmonic is 880 the following one is what is it 1760 etc etc so it doubles every time so we get you, you all know the series we, we get the harmonics but they're always part of the tone and we all know that too that when you play low c if you especially make it focused like this uh, quite a big part of that is the octave so this note the next one up is um, probably up to 20 percent of the tone or even more you can try uh, now there's so many free apps as well for spectrum analysis you record yourself and you can check exactly what happens when you change the color um, in general when you play with a darker sound like this you have more of the upper harmonics and when you make a hollow tone that has much less harmonics it's more of the of the tone itself um, so that's changing colors going a little bit ahead but um, but in the tone itself also we unfortunately on the flute the harmonics are not automatically in tune and we have to make sure they are so what I mean is this uh, if you hear this it sounds sharp right but it's not okay what about now let's do this I pull out the head joint and do the same thing it's flat in pitch right because I'm I'm way below the the 440 442 whatever you're tuning to 444 I'm way below that but the sound itself is sharp so it's a uh, pitch of the note is different from the tuning of the note so the harmonics inside the note are very important and I found that it's the same on um, other wind instruments as well I don't know what they do to fix it I, I know on the flute but I've played with a noble player once many many years ago who no matter what I did I could not find the note I don't know if you had this experience you you go down you go up and you have no idea and then there are other players who you play with one note and you know oh I'm a little below so you come right up and it fixes it instantly and if you have a player like that next to you you're lucky it's not always like that <laughs> but you want to be that player right so you you want to be the person who is easy to find even if if somebody notices okay his C sharp is a little sharp which is probably true you know top G may be sharp um, maybe top C sharp is flat they will sort of learn your trends and hopefully you know we we learn to also fight them but um, you want to be that person whose sound is easily found so the center of the tone has to be in the right place and that's what makes the sound with harmonics in tune um, so I will demonstrate also the other extreme when it's flat and th that's the fun one unfortunately I think over zoom it's not as effective but I think my gain is a little too high I'll turn it down just a bit so I can play so this one um, when you hear in person you go mad it's really extremely annoying it, it really makes you feel angry this sort of sound when you go so when you hear that in person uh, I'm I'm sure it's pretty horrible over zoom too but uh, when you hear it live it actually feels almost painful to your ears and w when I demonstrate this I usually play a little bit longer just to to make sure it really <laughs> gets through your ears and then I ask people why is it so annoying because I'm not I'm not actually playing super loud it's not annoying because we feel like we need earplugs right it's not annoying because um, it's 
it's hurting our ears, yet it feels like it does. And the reason for that is this. Check out the, the next harmonic up. So what happens when we blow so low? That's where the next harmonic is. Hear it again. So the harmonic range is completely screwed up. That's why instead of hearing what we want to hear, which is the octave, perfect octave and the fifth above it, that's what we hear the most. And then the following octave, right? These harmonics are uh, really in tune. The perfect octave, perfect fifth almost, and uh, the other octave. So that is always part of the good tone. And we're used to hearing that. But instead of this, we're hearing this horrible dissonant chord all the time going so the next harmonic actually doesn't move as much uh, you hear how much sharper it is than the main tone right you can even try to do a multiphonic ah. Ah, it, it's really painful sorry i don't want to do this <laughs> Don't worry, Dennis. It's, it's, it's painful, painful for us, us too. too. Oh, so happy to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> so um, the next harmonic is sounding too sharp in comparison to the main tone. And then the following harmonic as well. Uh, so you see that they are not moving at the same rate. They are moving uh, in the same direction, though but just not at the same rate. And we have to find that spot where they align. Um, which for most people, I would say for 90% of the people, it's a little bit lower than we're used to blowing because our natural tendency is to be a little bit sharp. So you're used to hearing most of the time. And it's a decent sound. It's not terrible and it's as they say which I completely agree better sharp than out of tune right <laughs> because at least when the tone is sharp it has a happy quality and that's something when you when you change your colors you will realize that when you're really exploring it um, that to make it sound a bit happier you just have to make the center of the tone go a little bit higher if you want to get a bit of the sadness you get it a little bit lower and it creates the quality to it. So, um, but anyway, we need to find the point where it's neutral, right, first. So that, um, if you explore, When you reach that point when harmonics are really, really well in tune, it gets this buzzy feeling, like buzzy sound. Like and that's the harmonics being aligned exactly in tune. It's not always the most beautiful sound because it's, it also depends what you do here and how much super focus you're getting. You get it overly focused, it's not pretty. It sounds like a razor blade, you know, going like through the air. So you want to find that point and then expand it with the throat as well which i'll talk about in a minute um, but that's a good starting point so getting this by the way this is the note bending exercise which i don't know how many of you know but um, it's, a, it's a very useful exercise for many reasons one is flexibility so one is starting above the flute and then getting the motion of the air all the way down into the flute. So going from... So you're practicing that movement up and down. Because when, when we play, of course, there's a constant adjustment. I don't agree with... Um, the theory, you know, some of the older teachers had, you just find one position that works for everything and stick to it. In reality, 
it doesn't work so well because you will get severe intonation problems. So even within one note, if we diminish, and to stay in tune when you get softer, you have to change the air direction. There's just no way around it, right? So the air has to go higher. And that, I, I see everybody nodding because I'm sure you, 99% of you are doing this already. Uh, so it's not, <laughs> it's not mind blowing uh, truth, but um, it's just the physical nature of the instrument. So note bending is a great warm up exercise. I, I like to do it sometimes for a minute in the morning just to get you know things going up and down. And then uh, the other thing you use it for is to find that, that center. And sometimes it can be tricky, especially if you, you know, uh, too much of listening. It's like smelling too many perfumes. You know, you, you sort of need some reset with coffee beans or whatever. Anyway, you can have your reset play. area. Right now it's a little bit hard to pinpoint the 100% point exactly and of course there's you know a few percent wiggle room where it's it's close enough because we're not machine suddenly louder the sound gets bigger which is very interesting and that's the, the harmonics aligning together and when you're the more out of tune you are the smaller it gets naturally so if you do Then, when you want to play uh, bigger, you, if you want to get to louder dynamics, you start using more air and forcing it into the fruit. And then we get this uh, sound which starts to break. And I don't know, my favorite example is Chandelinus, because uh, so many players do this. Overblowing and you can't hear the notes anymore. And actually, to play that with a, with a nice, beautiful, round, loud, low register, you don't have to blow any faster. So you, you have to realize that the the speed of the air remains the same for fortissimo and pianissimo. So if you play. the direction of the air. It has to go right into the flute. Another thing is you have to open much wider here, but not accelerate the air speed. Because if you do that, then you instantly get and you start hearing this ugly, forceful sound. So avoid doing that. You always have to have it slow in the low register, no matter how loud you want to get. So always open here open here, very large. And then you find physically it's actually not hard work. We, we feel like, oh, to play loud, it, it needs to be very physical, but it's not quite true. You have to sort of almost do the opposite, relax and just let the air flow naturally, just open it wider. And I like the analogy with the water tap. You know, when you fill up a bathtub, you have really large stream of water. You open and it goes slowly. The speed is the same, right, as the other tap. It's just the, the flow is much wider. And that's what we want with the air. Instead of accelerating, which will be like a, squeezing a hose and the water spraying all over. And that's what creates that, that forceful tone. Sorry, I'm going all over the place with, with this. Um, Coming back to note bending, anyway, finding this, um, the center. You will find that, especially for those of you who feel like the sound is lacking focus, uh, that probably means you're going too high. And I, I have met a few players 
who go too low for the center. And usually it's something like this. Yes, especially very very thin in the upper register when you do that when you close up then you hear this you know um, covered covered tone um, but then fixing that problem is not always just the throat you know which is of course also part of it so now um, assuming you found that center the the perfect spot um, the next thing we, we have to connect is is the throat which is equally important and um, everybody says, open your throat, but how do you actually do that? And what syllable is it? Because people say, oh, make it like ah. Uh, my teacher in Moscow was extremely good at this, actually. And he, he taught all of the kids, we were, you know, starting at eight, nine years old um, in his class. And you would see this really little kid, smaller than my son, who is almost 11 now. And these tiny little kids had the sound which was just blowing you away. Huge tone. And he, he had really good basics. And it was a lot to do with the throat opening. And um, so he said always not ah, but o. Oh. O, oh, because o oh makes your throat go lower. O, oh, o. Oh. And with guys, you see Adam Apple going here. So when you play, You see this movement here? It's a completely different sound. So moving this down sort of opens another space, another cavity, right? And I don't know exactly, probably, I don't know if some of you have studied more about the um, anatomy here. Now with the COVID tests, you know, I realized that the nasal cavity is really large as well <laughs> because they can go so deep in there with that stick right um, but i think when you do this you sort of um, lower this part you connect everything the nasal cavity and the throat and you create a larger resonating room in your mind i'm sorry about this noise can you hear me okay yeah yeah i'm glad that um our gardener has gone to your house dennis that's true <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry, this is terrible timing. I should have thought of that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I hope you, you hear me enough. So, um, speaking about the throat, the closest feeling to that is yawning. So when you yawn, you know, you do this, and you feel this moving down. That's basically it. That's the feeling you want when you, you play the flute. And both for forte and piano because it it makes that three-dimensional sound uh, when i heard whim for the first time live uh, i was shocked because it seemed like i had no idea where the sound is coming from it did not have this feeling of just you know one point where it's all coming at me but it sort of went around and it had this 3d feeling to it and i think that's to do with with opening this Oh yes, I remember what I was going to say. Um, if you think of the another analogy, grand piano and upright piano, why does it sound so different? The the size of the resonating box is very different. The actual string's length is not. I mean, of course, it's different on the on the big grand piano, but baby grand and upright piano have almost the same length of the strings. It's it's really the the shape of the box. And that's um, coming back to the beginning, what I was saying. If you just put the machine playing with the airstream, it's not going to be the same sound. It will have to be a box, I think, put next to the flute, a box of some shape, which would be blowing air. And the shape of that box will change the sound a lot. Guys, can you still hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, so the shape of the box is what we do. We, we can't change the shape inside of us, right? Because we're born with whatever is there and we, we've never even seen that part. But we can make sure that we open it. 
And I think that's uh, that yearning feeling. Feeling this. So always, the closest sensation is yearning, and another one is sending a very low note on the O. So this downward movement here. And I can demonstrate with the uh, just perfect focus, but this up here. And I don't want to say uh, tense throat or relaxed throat, because it's not the right terms to use here. Because when you do this, it's not exactly relaxing. You need to use some muscles to move it down. Just make sure it's not these muscles on the side, but it's muscles inside there to just move it down. So the difference. focused with harmonics in tune but it sounds extremely thin so then if you open this up so this makes all the difference in the world so I think the the main two things about the tone are finding that focus and getting that um, that space, <laughs> getting that um, that space in the throat. Dennis, we have a couple of questions. Um, Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I just. Do we have a question? Um, that I just wonder if maybe uh, we can get to. Um, so, how do you? One of the questions is, how do you find your embouchure? How do, how is how do you get your setup? Oh, please don't try to copy my embouchure. <laughs> I don't think you, you would be able to, or I would be able to if I was in another body. Um, it happened naturally like this sideways when I was a kid. When I started playing the flute uh, in my hometown, before I had the proper teacher who would actually talk about embouchure and everything, it was like that naturally for me, sideways. And then when I got to my teacher in Moscow who actually was really good at basics and he um, he considered changing it trying to straighten it but then he said you know what if it works just leave it like that and then later on when I went to London to William Bennett he um, also looked at all of this and uh, he he thinks that maybe one side was more developed muscles wise and also I have a teardrop and sometimes those of you who has a teardrop in the middle more it's harder to to make a central embouchure because it's it's sort of covering more so to open there when you you open it creates a larger opening so it's hard to control i think uh, that's why a lot of players who have a teardrop they end up with the side i'm sure and for most of the people it's on the left side and um oh thank god this stopped <laughs> so if you look actually at um Marcel Moise, Rampal, Nicolet, they all played on the left. Yeah. Well, Nicolet not as much, but he was almost central, but uh, Mo Moise was especially. It's not something I can change, but um, speaking of muscles, I think um, relaxing, I'm sure is very important, the corners. For me, it's basically one corner. So I kind of deal with half embouchure on the, my upper lip. I put it in the middle on the lower, always I start here, but then when I play, the upper lip moves. So, it, was that the, the the question, or was it uh, more about? I think, I think that's a that's a great answer. I mean, what what you know, as a horn player, what's interesting to note is like you talk a lot about air and how the air interacts with the instrument, and I think this is the same with horn. It's like this is the basis of of production more so than having a perfect setup, mm -hmm. or or a, you know something that is stereotypically right. It's it's this interaction of the of the airstream. We have a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, that have come in uh so you're talking about opening your throat um so how do you control the dynamics without affecting the sound quality and then what is your tongue position when you when you're thinking of this yawning open position oh that's a good question so when you when you open i think the back of your tongue sort of drops a little bit right i mean
Yeah, tongue is a whole other issue. I, I don't think a lot about it uh, when not tanning. Because I think as long as it's not on the way of the airstream, it's okay. And we all have different shapes and lengths of tongue as well. Um, but um, dynamics, so for, for that, I'm not sure the sound quality doesn't change. I mean, it does change the color, right? Um, but you can't avoid it. When you play softer, you naturally want to use a softer color. And that's sort of so connected to dynamics and colors that you shouldn't separate one from the other. But um, that said, what you mean probably is not going flat, for instance, on piano or going sharp on forte. I think that depends on the air speed. So, uh, as I was showing earlier, if you play... Even when you play this softly, with almost, almost uh, no sound, the air speed itself should be the same. So this and... and Sorry, I can't get it not to split right now, but um, this uh, feeling, even though you're barely touching with the air, so it's the direction, but the, the speed inside is exactly the same. That, that's what changes the pitch. The, the faster the air, the higher the pitch. And you can especially see that with octaves, right? Or harmonics. Now we start slowing down. The slower you go, the lower it goes in the notes. It keeps switching. So if you ever had this, and I don't think there's one person who has never had this happen because every flute player has, when you play, and you crack at the end of the note like that, that means you've slowed down too much. So much, in fact, that it was closer to that note. That's why it cracks. And we, of course, tend to do that at the end of the note because um, there are two ways we can diminish. One is, slowing down the air. And there's one huge flaw with that, right? It gets flat. And luckily for us, this is a more versatile instrument than the recorder, because on the recorder, that's pretty much the only way you can do it, because you're covering the embouchure. So when you want to play softer, you have to slow down the air. And that's why I think it's not always the best thing for flute players starting on the recorder, because you develop that habit. Uh, anyway, it's another conversation. But uh, same thing with playing louder on the recorder, you, you accelerate. So there are always these fluctuations in pitch, unless you're a real pro who can you know, come to fight that with uh, uncovering holes, and some of them do. But on the flute, it's, it's all happening here. So you, when you diminish, so if you want the niente, basically what happens is the air going all the way off until this point where there's no more contact uh, with the lip plate. So if you always make sure when you end the note like that, that it's always the air moving away from the flute all the way up and not slowing down, it, it cannot possibly crack. If the air remains at the same speed, even if you want it to, it will not crack. It will remain there. But it's it's still hard for us to fight. And especially if you're out of shape, no matter how many years you've played, I've played the flute for over 30 years, still, you still ha have this happen because, because it's such a natural thing for us to want to slow down the air. So that is one of the habits we have to fight. Anyway, sorry, it's a long answer. Oh, Terrific. And, and uh, another question that's come in, and this is, this is, I'm fascinated by this because I don't have to play that many fast notes uh, because I play the horn, so it's lucky. But on the flute, you have to play, you know, there's 
huge amount of coordination that goes on between fingers and tongue. Do you have, you have, what are your suggestions for, you know, lining up those coordinations in stuff like, you know, Mendelssohn, Midsummer Night's Dream, or, you know, the, these pieces, maybe the, the um, Carnival of the Animals, these, these, these things where like if the if the coordination of the tongue and the air and the lips and and the and the fingers are not hundred percent, things don't sort of work. So do you have do you have some suggestions and drills that would help that? Well, I think um, I mean the answer is also somewhat ob obvious, and I hate to say, it, but practice slowly. <laughs> you know, uh, practicing slowly is really amazing for everything. It's not only for fast stuff, but even for relatively slow things, I find that slowing myself down and really getting, for instance, voicing, when you have two voices going on and you really want to show one and less of the other, this sort of things I find I, I have to practice slowly. Because um, if you think of something like, you know, this sort of polyphonic playing, um, it's really hard to work on that in tempo, even if the fingerings are not difficult. So, especially when you have to synchronize your fingers, you have to slow yourself down and, and see what's happening. So, one difficulty, of course, is always the cross movement, right? So, when one hand is going up, the other, one finger going up, another down, and then you have to line. We all know the example of the G and the long B flat fingering, which I always try to avoid. I'm pretty good at this, but there's always that moment where you hear there's no real legato, as opposed to you know, it's so much easier with the thumb, so please use that. Uh, so again, getting off topic. But for coordinating tongue and fingers, practicing slowly helps practicing with rhythms. And another fun tool, which I use sometimes, and actually, I've used that a few years ago when I was practicing um, Cardinal of the Animals, not this run, but um, five years ago or so, um, is recording yourself in slow motion. And that wouldn't work so well for the horn because you're already in the much lower register. But for the flute, um, also be careful with the number of frames. Nowadays, the phones got too good, you know, so you have 240 frames, which would be a little bit too low. It's hard to hear. But 120 frames is perfect. So you are slowing down yourself four times and uh, it will go down a couple octaves. Is it three octaves? Anyway, um, no, two octaves, I think. Anyway, you, you, you'll find out. I think it is two octaves, yeah. So a kernel of animals goes. And you start hearing this sort of things. So you realize, oh, or, um, Recently, I recorded a student's passage, and you hear I'm exaggerating, but it was something like this. So, um, recording yourself in slow motion can be useful for just checking what's happening, because sometimes when you go full speed, it's hard to realize what it is, what sounds out of time. And from outside, it's easier, but hearing yourself is harder. So usually, of course, ka comes a little bit late. That's a common thing. The fingers are not moving together with the tongue um, and things like that. So you can sort of anticipate and, and fix that uh, as you're playing. Yeah, terrific. Makes sense. Yeah, what, I, I don't know which app you use. I, I use an app called uh, Total, Tonal, Tonal Energy Tuner, uh, TE Tuner on the on the phone uh, and that has a feature where you can record and actually on an iPhone actually wind it down to I think it's a quarter of the speed um, which is right. very scary. Does the pitch? It, I don't think it changes the pitch. I can't. Okay, that's cool. But it's, um, yeah, it's a useful, useful app. It's a, like a very, you know, $4 app, very cheap, very easy. Um, oh. we, like, we like apps here. Uh, for those of you who came yesterday, uh, the Seconds Pro app is, is a favorite of mine for organizing your practice but the tonal energy tuner is another good one um yeah it's interesting it's interesting as a horn player hearing you know 
I always like hearing Dennis talk about fundamentals and technique because there are so so many similarities between all of the all of the wind instruments, uh, and and the and the way that we get to the to the same result is is very similar. It's you know slow practice, making sure that you know things are organised and that and that you're clear in your mind of you know what the steps are that you want to you want to take to actually get that quality result. Um, so for um, I think we've got one more question, but I'm just going to jump in for two seconds, Dennis. So um, it's great to see uh, the people who are involved in our spring program, the flute players who are here. I didn't see any horn players this morning, but um, uh, so we've been working with uh, with a bunch of flute players uh, in our IM program over the spring, uh, and they've been fortunate enough to work with Dennis with uh, individual lessons and group sessions on technique and performance. Uh, and also with the other five principles of the LA Phil. Um, over the spring, we're opening up the uh, the summer course is open now. Uh, if anyone's interested in, in uh, working further with Dennis and the other five principles of the LA Phil, uh, the link is in the chat. We'd love to have a chat with you uh, about what the possibilities uh, for you can be. It's been really exciting to, uh, to see the development of our group over the last year with Dennis. Um, every week is, uh, is really amazing learning learning so many things about flute technique and flute performance and getting through so much repertoire and actually just hearing Dennis play as well. I'm sure we can all all agree with that. Um, Dennis, uh, why do you, how do you make it sound so easy? <laughs> this is always one of the things that I notice sitting behind Dennis in the orchestra is like Dennis has no stress. He, he walks on stage, always looks extremely elegant and sits down and plays amazing and it's and it looks so easy so dennis how do you how do you do that while the rest of us are well out? i i mean i can say the same about you andrew but i think it's actually um first of all it's not true i i do get nervous you just don't see me on the front you know you, you sit um but i think it is important part though of playing that the audience is not nervous for you so um you know you you want to focus on the musical part of it not on the technical and i think the the funny thing is that whatever you are feeling when you play you project it whether you want or not so if you are feeling worried about the passage or so into fingers we somehow we feel the same thing so that's why when when the person is really um you know how you hear the same piece played and you think, oh my God, this is so difficult. And that's the feeling I never want the audience to have. And that's what Andrew is saying. And I think uh, it's so important that you don't feel it's so hard and people can focus on other things than the technical difficulty of it. That's why I think it's important to get the um, um, all your technical issues solved completely before you're performing so you're not at all thinking about that when you're on stage because that's that's one thing I never want to be doing you know standing there and thinking like oh my god I hope this fingering works now uh, this is one, one thing I think we have to not have on the way because it's an obstacle and we, we don't want to have it and actually Wib helped me with this too he said when you come on stage even if it's really hard and you're sometimes underprepared it happens I mean we try not to be but um, no matter what, you can't change your level of preparation at this point. It is going to be what it is, as <laughs> the previous president said, it is what it is. Uh, so you, you sort of have to let it go and just enjoy making music. I think that's, that's the goal. And he said, because for me, the problem was especially playing in international competitions. I found I would freak out in the first round more than any other round because you come alone for the first time in the room you play without piano there are these judges there who are the players you've grew up listening to you know recordings so it's a lot of stress and uh, i asked him what do you do and he said well just when you come on stage forget all the all of that and just try to to make music and that's the goal <laughs> Yeah, it's a fantastic advice, and it's something that uh, so Dinka Vlakovic, who is uh, a fantastic uh, mental coach, actually that works with our with our people in the uh, in the Investor Musician program. She talks a lot 
about exactly these things and, and developing these tools so that you can actually, when you get to the stage, you focus on what you want to do, what you want to present, and that you can go for it. And this is a really important element of this. And I think what, what you're saying, Dennis, is absolutely spot on that there is, there's no more technical work you can do when you're sitting on the stage. You can't improve your technique. What you can do is just, you know, let the technique that you have shine. And one of the things that I really love about listening to Dennis play is that his technical level is so far beyond what is required for the repertoire. And that's pretty obvious that, you know, that's something that you work on and, and I've, I've listened to Dennis's classes and, you know, with the, with the study work that he does with the students. And, and uh, it's, re it's really impressive that this, this idea of, of ex expanding the technical sphere beyond what, whatever you're going to need to play in the orchestra. And so then when, when Dennis plays in the orchestra, it, it sounds easy because it's well within, you know, the capabilities. And I think this is a really good, a good thing for us to all, all think about. There is, there is one question about... Um, about while well, I get it in the chat, um, I think it was tongue, or just basically your chin and your relationship with your chin and jaw to the to the um, to the instrument, Dennis. Um, do you think about moving your jaw forward for certain things? That yes, it... absolutely. So um, I think jaw forward and lips forward is the same thing which we talk about, right? And um, that was one thing my teacher in Moscow didn't. Um, he, he studied in France and he, he brought a lot of things back to Russia and um, also evolved on some on his own. But this was one thing he said, Nikolai told me to move my jaw forward. And they asked him, oh, when and why? You know, that was my first, there, there was my questions to him. And he's like, I don't know. He just said, move the jaw forward. So move the jaw forward. But then, of course, um, later when I came to study with Web and he was doing all the basics with me the first year. Um, yes, we, we changed the direction of the air. How does it happen? We have two lips, right? So to move the air up, and you can do it without the flute, it's very obvious that the lower lip has to come in front. And to put the air down, the upper lip has to come in front. So it's, it's this movement. And for that, we, we use the lips forward. So when you want to go up, you move the jaw forward and the lips forward. When you want to go down, since we can't really move the jaw back, don't hurt yourself trying, <laughs> you, uh, but we can move it down. So when, you, uh, when you're trying to focus the sound and go lower into the instrument, just moving your chin down, opening the jaw a little bit helps. Because this way you change the angle and it's easier to put the air into the instrument and it's easier for the upper lip to come in front. Another thing is, um, uh, I find it necessary if you want to put the air all the way into the instrument down, that there's some air between your upper lip and upper teeth. So you create a cushion here. And you're going. That is crucial because that the air, the pressure of the air is, is um, creating the embouchure. So that's why for me, I can't replicate, and especially in, in my crooked way, um, I can't replicate the embouchure without the instrument because it's the air which should form the embouchure, not the other way around. And that, I think, is also an important concept because we all think, okay, we'll create this perfect embouchure and blow out of it. But it's not true because the air pressure creates the embouchure as well. So having that air going um, between your teeth and upper lip can help you to direct it also lower into the flute. So. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, cool. It's, it's, it's so many similarities because it's the same with horn. If, if the air is not the thing that is, you know, driving the show, the embouchure has to do way too much work and it manipulates the sound and we don't have the, the quality of vibration. So, yeah, the air actually forming the embouchure is a, is a great concept, isn't it? That is especially true for upper register, and that's something I realized a lot later after graduating from school. To, to get a nice, relaxed pianissimo in the upper register, it's all about the air. It's not the embouchure. Because I was trying, and I would get very tense, you know, getting... to try and get soft, as, as Andrew said. It's way too much work for the embouchure. But instead, if you think just of the air, it 
it's a very relaxing feeling. You don't have to be stressed at all about this. So it's just having that air push it and, and let it happen. All you have to do is control how much to open. You know, the softer you get, of course, the more you want to close between the lips. Anyway. Dennis, this has been really terrific. Uh, always a great treat to uh, to hear you talk about uh, your thoughts on on playing, and it's always it always blows my mind the similarities between flute and and horn. Uh, you know, in in all of these areas, it's one of the things we actually t teach in the in the brass uh, technique classes is the is the these concepts of breathing and and how important the air is, uh, and they definitely cross over. So um, this has been really great. Thank you. On behalf of everyone, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Really awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thanks for having me over, Andrew. This is really fun. Nice to see your faces from all over the world. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you.